There is so much What's interference, like? spiritual unease, what she wearing? But and a good she deal her clothes, to Hardy some of splashing up, as has been intimated, knows when she's a wave of him no she's thrown reason. from and some corner, like a wash and absent and and everywhere. for the whole Again, of literature that lies before us, word, don't you see? The 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 like a land we live in, once we've moved there, in the pure figures of our former life, like those glorious Greek animals, those heroes kidnapped from gods, those Plato's amorous Countries, whose names who don't know, going away through dark meadows, whose long dark and guns, geometry. the water type boots wading regions, through the foul meadow grass on bleak, wintry, distant shores, with guns at half cock, whose most mechanical of when he is one, and moving smoothly as a stream. Imagination is, as Sam said, the unifying power of the stir, growing great with blood, but never has it swollen up and low. They represent us, shadowy as trout, in sudden, brief as fleas. Yet only here in this sweet country of the word are rivers, streams, woods, gardens, houses, mountains, waterfalls, and the crowding fountains of the trees eternal as it's right they should be. Hey, this is Nick. This is David. And this is Nathan, and welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Today we're talking about William H. Gass's Willie Masters' Lonesome Wife, a book about a lonesome woman, maybe. <laughs> it's kind of hard to describe. There's lots of typographic flourishes. Um, it's quite experimental, and I think, why don't we just jump in right there. Uh, anybody else want to try to describe this book? Ooh, I would say it's kind of the like postmodern collage experimental fiction equivalent of the film Barbarella. Catchy. That's what I, that's what I'm going with. Put that in your tagline pipe and smoke it. Who's got a tagline pipe? <laughs> <laughs> I'm selling them now in the apocalypse. Ah, I see. It's metaphorical. Yes. Uh, David, what's your what's your tagline? Uh. This is a book full of William H. Gass's sentence boners. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's uh, language porn is what I was going to say. It's uh, yeah. he, his, he loves sentences. He loves the sound of words. And this is him in a putting it in trying to put it in some sort of visual context of how much he loves language and how much you should not treat it like a prostitute to be just something that you fuck and leave it's something you must make love to in order to really appreciate it yeah is there thank you for describing it i think those are both uh those are accurate ways of describing it is there is there a, a story that we can or a plot of any kind that we can anchor this to because for the reader so because i think there's a lot to talk about style but what does that style style uh, anchor itself to or is there really anything to talk about there Good question. I mean, what what really happens in this? There's like a right. kind of a play section. <laughs> There's a, a play section where a, a penis is baked into some sort of baked good, right? And that's yeah. essentially the plot line there. And that the the husband whose penis is baked into the bun could only recognize his wife by looking under her skirt. Right. <laughs> that was. So I think that was the central uh, event of the book. I guess. W was it? Yeah. So essentially, it's, the, it's this woman narrating partially her relationship to men and she relates this to to her i guess she has some sort of act some sort of vaudevillian type of performance in part of her life and then she was also maybe a prostitute a stripper a dancer i'm not really sure but essentially her life prior to being married to willie master who then ignored her was treated pretty poorly by men to the point where she doesn't really distinguish one between the other because they just she either used them or they used her. It's kind of a two-way street there, maybe. And she's just sort of recounting part of her life. I guess that's really, that's really, and she only really recounts even, not even really her life, though. It's just these little yeah. snippets. So there's not much of an anchor. And it it's also, one reason I think it's it's hard to parse out what might have happened is that it's told with simultaneous texts running throughout and interrupting each other. For the first half of the book, I had a hard time reading it because I didn't realize what was going on. And so I was just jumping from 
I guess there's kind of parallel, they're not even exactly narratives, but sort of parallel narratives, literally set in different type. And I just read it linearly. So it was just like jumping around like crazy. And I'm like, what am I reading? (laughs) Yeah. So after trying to unpack the plot or collection of events or collection of event in this, maybe the best question is, is if this is really Gas's you know, attempt at displaying his love of language and kind of equating all these themes of sexuality to language itself. Is it even necessary to have gone so far into the like experimental category of type? And I mean, there's a section on huge footnotes that sort of predates a lot of <laughs> classic like post postmodern like footnote masturbatory text stuff, right? Mm. Like he's doing a lot of these tricks pretty early in the grand scheme of things. But like, is it just a trick or is there a need for that form at all? I think that goes towards what his message is, though, is that language is and can be played with and that it should be sort of enjoyed and played with, right? He talks about, like, there's this whole section, which I think maybe you, he, Nick might have read in the beginning. I can't remember. And you probably <laughs> could have can heard tell. it. Yeah, which I think he talks about that every act of imagination, something about it being a disdain of utility if that was your section or not i can't remember but that was my section oh okay so yeah there is there is this sort of attack on plain spoken language and language being this function of utility that it should be this playful joyous maybe even sexual experience or sensual i don't know yeah i mean i got the feeling and uh, another thing that he does throughout the whole thing is Uh, I mean, I made a list of kind of all of the different formats that he uses, and there are, I don't know, over a dozen. Can you read a few? Just go through them real quick. Sure. So these are some of the things I wrote down. I think there's actually more than this, but there's a play. There's like trashy romance fiction. There's ad copy. There's erotica. There's sort of uh, critique. There's footnotes and side notes. uh, There's late 19th century Victorian type kind of sprinkled throughout including Copperplate, Tuscan, Victorian. Uh, I actually found these fonts because I was curious. There's sort of lens distortion from the the printmaking process, uh, projection onto the body, runaround text, making a shape, black letter, stencil signage, cartoon lettering, and mirroring. And I think there's I think there's more than that. But to me, it's it's really just like a sandbox of ideas. Like I, I didn't get so much the 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 feeling that he was you know, judging or condemning any of these forms, but like, isn't it fun that we can use language to write ad copy and it can do this and we can use English to make you feel this way and and this way and we can just do it for fun and we can make it make sounds out of it. Um, So to me, it it was, I I didn't read it so much as like, I, I think there's a lot of judgment in the book, but I think it's more for like maybe language police who would say like, oh, that's bad language and that's good language. Um, and I think he's saying like, it's fun. Yeah. We talk a lot about the concept of, of showing, not telling. And I feel like this is an example of showing things to the max. And I think that that's, that's kind of like a gas thing. I realize as I've, as I've read more and more of his stuff is that like, rarely is he ever just like telling you, this is what it is. It's really, it's about the show. And if you ever read anything about like his writing process, it like, is not a fun experience for him. He's very like crippled by it. He's very, he's a perfectionist, right? And so I think it's because, yeah, like his, um, I mean like the tunnel, like supposedly it took him like 20 years to write and and he, he's also, he's he's Midwestern too. So he's kind of like a negative person, right? Which which I identify with. Um, (laughs) But like, yeah, I think he's very sort of like judgmental and self-critical of like what he's making, right? And that's partially why I think this at like some level, which it's, it's crowded in, or sorry, it's, it's, it's cl- uh, clouded with a lot of like overt sexuality and stuff. But I think it's almost him trying to get outside of his own, uh, I don't know, like crippled mindset with respect to language and then just show how much you can play with it. That's kind of what I think he's doing as the writer, as the sometimes narrator of this. Mm-hmm. When he blends through, it's just it's just that pure like, Honestly, for him, it does feel like an eroticism for words. I mean, an eroticism for eroticism. I, I, I feel like, 
I feel like it's really it seems to be common to downplay the fact that like okay so this is there's a metaphor going on here between eroticism and language but there's a lot of straight up eroticism and photos of naked women in here I mean it's it is and I I can't I think that's part of the point also that the it kind of it's a it's like kind of leveling the playing field of of language like hey there's this vulgar thing and you think that that's you know beyond redemption or whatever but hey watch I'll I'll turn it into something else but I'm really curious about this the fact that he was a perfectionist and struggled with the writing process because it just it feels so free and crazy and there's so many bad ideas in here that I can't believe that anybody would <laughs> ever publish this who was self-critical <laughs> Well, he was incredibly critical of it later in his life. I think he called it a failure in many ways, right? I mean, this is like if you've ever tried to make like a concept record as a band, like you sit around, and you're like, man, I got this really great idea. And then you like execute the thing. <laughs> and then like later you look back at it and you're like, man, that was like 17 ideas. We should have really just made one. <laughs> like it's too much stuff going on. Too many, too many flourishes. Just simplify it. And I think that was kind of like Gas's mindset of this, right? The thing I like about Gas is, to me, he's like a middle ground between like where modernism ended up, like your, you know, your classic Joyce's, Faulkner's, Beckett's, stuff like that. And then like the postmodernism stuff as, you know, people took that and Barth and Dave Foster Wallace and uh, Pynchon and all that, like kind of really blew it up into this total maximalism. Like most of Gas's stuff is kind of a reserved middle ground. And that's like what I like about it, which is why this to me is kind of almost... Uh, like an excursion from that. Maybe this like got it out of his system before he kind of tightened everything else up. Where does this fall in his um, career? Uh, pretty early. I think it's late 60s, right? Yeah. It's like 68 or something. Yeah. So like his main like story collection from the that time period in the heart of the heart of the country is roughly then. I think Omen Setter's Luck, which we'll talk about next podcast, is also late 60s. Which both of those are are much more like classical. Honestly, they they really feel like the the missing link between like some Faulkner stuff and some early Cormac McCarthy. So they're a lot more focused on a singular idea than this stuff. But yeah, it's I could see Gas being like, oh yeah, this is this has got too much stuff going on because <laughs> it definitely does. So we kind of talk a little bit about what we think he's trying to do. Do you think do you think it's successful at all? Does it change? Do you come out of this any different in your approach to, to language or to anything? To me, it kind of, it. Uh, I don't know how you're going to mix the voices that we did at the beginning, but when <laughs> Nick's voice comes out at the end, I think there's something kind of beautiful about that. And yeah. I think the part that I read actually in that, that probably nobody's going to be able to understand, uh, kind of did that for me in this book where you're just like, there's so much going on and there's so much noise. And I'm like, why am I even reading all of this? And it's fun. I mean, I, th I do think it's fun. I think his writing is, he writes wonderful sentences and obviously loves the language a lot. Um, but then there's kind of this embedded essay about imagination. And I think it's worth reading on its own, even if you don't wade through the rest of the, the little novella. But the fact that it's kind of embedded in there, I, I kind of like, cause I was like, oh, wow, that's a pretty powerful idea. What is the idea? Uh, I actually wrote down this whole quote because I, I like it. It's several pages worth, but it's about imagination. It's about like, ah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a defense of the inexplicableness of living imaginatively and how you're pursuing a completeness and a oneness that probably there's no place for and probably nobody will understand, but there's something wonderful about that. And especially in a world that's increasingly fragmented and specialized where you're expected to be fragmented and specialized and if you try to create a, a wholeness, you'll be misunderstood. But yet that wholeness is always there. Something like that. Yeah. No, I, I think there's there's that one paragraph that's really good. The man of imagination is generally a man of his time. And because he is with his medium, again, I mentioned that, capable of life to a greater stretch than others. He tells us all what it is like to be a proper man or woman now. Such a thing it is to be a poet, and in an age so shattered out like glass and specialities, so brittle, so irregular, so plainly seen, as glass is empty of everything but simple passage, that the role of poet is despised as cheap, unmanly, useless, walk-on, butch. But he is with us just the same, beneath our breath, beneath our skin, in all our human possibilities. And when we loose our tongue, then he will speak. Yeah, I think this book is so sort of bombastic and 
wild and all these things that Nathan mentioned, that long list of all the different typographical play, many of them are even on the same page or the same two pages when you open the book. And I think that there's a sort of key in there that he says, when we loose our tongue, there's a certain sense of like being loose and being free with with language that allows you to, it's almost like the imagination is both a a vessel for language and language is a way to further explore the imagination, right? They're, they're in this sort of symbiotic relationship. Yeah. So, so question to kind of counter that. So if, the, if this is an explorational language, I'm curious to what extent do you think this is praising vulgarity versus maybe critiquing or lampooning it? Cause I think it's more of the latter, but it's hard to tell because kind of, you know, likening it to postmodern Barbarella it certainly has a ton of erotic content. So if he's playing with language, is he playing with this in a, hey, we should explore all this stuff? Or is he playing with it in a way to make fun of it? I didn't read it as, I mean, there's, there's some lampooning and I think it's uh, it's playful. I didn't feel like it was, it's not it's not like hateful of, of it. It's like, let's have fun with it. Kind of like Tarantino's approach to, to pulp. It's like he, he loves pulp and he, mm-hmm uses pulp to make something interesting that maybe the pulp didn't have to begin with. Um, but like, I think a great example of this in the book is uh, this, the really weird, it's like a page out of a romance novel. It even has a title. Do you remember that one? Like the stable boy passion, oh, yeah. stable boy. <laughs> That's like yeah. some DH Lawrence stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's really weird and funny. And it's, it just yeah. kind of starts in the middle of a sentence and ends in the middle of a sentence. And it's just like plastered there right in the middle of this, and I think he does that on purpose, right? Because it's all the same. So he's, he's, I think he's ridiculing it in a way, but having fun in his own way. Like he starts in the middle, he ends in the middle because it doesn't matter where you pick up a, that kind of novel. It's all going to read the same. Yeah. And like the, the social context of, you know, like the classic obscenity trials and, you know, Lady Chatterley's Lover and the fact that like a lot of those sort of more obscene, more grotesque, more like overtly sexual books that we now appreciate as like full-blown literary classics they came out of a publisher an english language publisher in paris that was also a pornographic publisher and so like we kind of look back and we're like oh i can't believe that all these things were censored right but they actually just came out of like an illicit source in the first place where the line between actual like pornographic works and these like you know now highbrow classics was really really narrow and so, like, the passions of the stable boy, which feels like a Lady Chatterley's lover kind of thing, like, I feel like he's kind of making fun of that while also sticking this right in the middle of, like, you know, late 60s, like, free love counterculture stuff, too. So there's, there's kind of, like, this cyclical repetition of these, like, topics of sexuality, too, that I think he's, like I said, making fun of. Again, not to kind of harp that it's all about language, but I think it is that it all needs to be there. So whether it's vulgarity, whether it's pornography, whether it's erotica, they all need to exist. So you know where the lines are in each of them, but all of them have their place. And in maybe, ah, shit, now I feel like I'm kind of contradicting myself. So if they all need to exist, so you can know where the lines are. So maybe he's not as harsh, as critical as I think he is to utilitarian language then, or maybe he is. Fuck, I can't. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Wait, but I think, I, I think, I, I think I, you're getting on exactly the right thing. And I, I, I want to read a section from uh, uh, On Being Blue, which okay. is like his essay they wrote in the '70s. And I honestly, I think this is a decoder ring for this book because so much of this is like, yes, it's based on the concept of what blue means, but it's also based on sexuality and literature. And so uh, I'll read a section. He says, uh, I have been dropping hints all along like heavy shoes that the ultimate and essential displacement is to the word and that the true sexuality in literature, sex as a positive aesthetic quality, lies not in any scene and subject, nor in the mere appearance of a vulgar word, not in the thick smear of a blue spot, but in the consequences on the page of love well made, made to the medium which is the writer's own, for he, for she, has only these little shapes and sounds to work with. The same saliva surrounds them all. Every word is equally a squiggle or a noise, an abstract designation. The class of cocks, for instance, or the subclass of father defilers. And a crowd of meanings as randomly connected by time and use as a child connects his tinker toys. And so here he he does exactly that contradiction where he's talking about like the vulgarity and the explicitness of language and literature while also writing a vulgar and explicit sentence. 
And that's what I think he's he's trying to figure out. Like he, it's all contradictory. On one hand, it's playing, but on the other hand, he's saying you got to limit it. I mean, I, I think there's an aspect of this too that all language is pornography. Go on. All language is the the pornification of direct experience. It's not it's not truth. It it is uh, too many steps removed. Well, I don't understand what you mean. How can all language be? No, pornography? actually, <laughs> I see it's a, it's I, I see a tool. where you're going with like, this. I think. Uh, there is, there's reality. So there's a, um, so reality is actual real sex. So there's, there's this quote, uh, by Roger Scruton that kind of, I read recently that I'm going to compare this to, and it's maybe not perfect, but I think it kind of is in the ballpark. He says the goal of pornography is to desacralize the sexual act, to detach it from love and commitment and to put it on sale as a commodity. In other words, to make it utilitarian. And I think that language in so far as it represents something, it is taking something and let's say something that is that is true, that is real, and making it portable so that we can get things done with it. Maybe that's not a perfect thing, but I, you know, Gas himself responded in a, in a in an interview, and he says, "Fiction is not a road to truth. If you want to take the road to truth, you go through science or philosophy, mathematics, possibly." Um, so I think there's a leveling of language that he's doing, and it's like. We think that some language is good and some language is bad, but in fact, it's all pornography and you can play with all of it. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. all distorting and creating a good at some level. And when you get to shape it like that, it's no longer reality. And if you're making it in some way that's appealing or attractive to others, then yeah, how is how is that different from, as you said, Nathan, pornography? Because we all know real life is super boring, much like... Real sex, I guess. As a comparison. <laughs> I mean, none of us like sex, right? <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> uh, my mom's gonna be so upset with this podcast. Does your mom listen to these? Yeah, no, she does. Hi, mom. I appreciate you tuning in. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool mom. She's a cool mom. Yeah. Hi, next mom. <laughs> Although, did she make it this far into this one? I guess we'll find out in a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how many people we lose with our intro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that's the, that's the whole conundrum of this is like, Gas is and has forever been like a contradictory person. And like, if you read a lot of his works, they have that sort of cyclical, like ex- exploration of a, th- of a single thought. Um, you know, he's typically pretty obsessed with a lot of identity, a lot of, um, you know, personal history, a lot of like the concept of like, what is the character that we play in real life? What's, who are we really versus the variations of ourself that we present in different situations and all that. And I don't really feel that that's exactly what this book is about. I feel like this is actually more of almost like a subterranean ex like exploration of those concepts just about words right Mm. is like how do words present themselves in different contexts like Mm -hmm. is anything ever is there ever some consistent reality anywhere or is it all just sort of contextual i think that's that's what this form is doing too is like form puts things in a certain context and by playing with that he's essentially pre-distorting or post-distorting these things and so, like, there's really just a lot of variables. Like, we think of a sentence as a thing on a sheet of paper, but, like, what is, if you really start to unpack that, there's just a million different directions that can go. And honestly, that's the whole argument for reading books in the first place. There's just an infinite number of variations, you know, Borges style. We'll just fill that library right up. Yeah. And so it, that's what makes it interesting. Can I um, get real nerdy for just a second? You may. So, I, uh, went down a rabbit hole trying to identify the fonts that he used in the book because there's some cool kind of circusy looking fonts. And I was like, that looks familiar. I bet I can find it. It took me a while, but I found a lot of them. And um, most, if not all of them, come from uh, the American Type Founders Company. And something that that, uh, uh, Type Foundries do, or used to do, is release specimen catalogs, which are really cool if you haven't seen one. Um, There's... The archive.org has these old American Type Founders Company type specimens online. You can look through the whole thing. 
And what those are is they show everything that they have for sale and they, they uh, have like s- snippets of text to go with it. So the whole thing is like one giant postmodern work of fiction. Yeah, um, it's like, a, 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 it's a, like sliver a, of time. a Burroughs like cut up of just cool typography and random images. Oh, that's really cool. They're so cool. I love them. And I, I was looking at these. And I was like, I bet a lot of people haven't seen these um, because, you know, being a graphic designer, I I love these things. So there's that. So I think uh, check those out. But also around this time, there was a new technology in typography called photo lettering that allowed you to set type much faster and get really weird and funky with it. And this happened in the early 60s. And partly because of that, there was like this revival of very ornamental typography. Um, And I I can't help but wonder what the relationship between that, maybe he was being exposed to this stuff. I don't know if he had any connection to advertising because, because that, that I suspect would have permitted him to even make a book like this, that technology that, that was just getting off the ground at that time. And you were just seeing a revival of all of these sort of very ornamental Victorian typefaces. Yeah. I mean, there's a designer credited for this too, right? Yeah. I did see him credit a designer. Lawrence Levy. I did not look this designer up, though. So an exercise for the listener is to figure out who that was. Who <laughs> is Because we didn't Lawrence do our Levy. research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I don't know if that's fair. I was going to rely on you for that, Nathan, because I don't know anything about anything. Yeah, I mean, Eric it's a good question. Eric helped me a little though, bit like... with this, too, by the way, identifying some of these. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll crowdsource this question. Um, <laughs> but like... One of my uh, favorite small details about uh, Faulkner is that the first chapter of The Sound and the Fury, which you've ever read that, is very chaotic. It's, you know, written from uh, the viewpoint of uh, somebody who's mentally disabled. It's very confusing. Um, It moves between perspectives. But uh, Faulkner at one point had talked about wanting to set that in like different colors or like different types or something to like specify that to the reader. And it like never happened. And I don't know if that was the thing that just got cut or if it's an anecdote or if I've just completely made up this story because we're in the middle of isolation times and I talk with myself <laughs> a lot. Um, but uh, like to me, that's kind of like a, a useful thing of like maybe the technology lagged and that people are still churning on that idea. And now we're seeing somebody in the late 60s go after that. Can y'all hear my cat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, gladly. <laughs> the joys of fully remote recording. <laughs> We've now entered your regular life. <laughs> she can hear me in here. She's meowing at the door. Is she making any excellent... Do you guys... Like a bunch of cat stuff shows up in, in Gas's books. I don't know if you noticed that, but I've noticed a bunch of like cat passages and I think that he was a cat person. So very, very on brand. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Looking yeah. forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> can you just uh, I get think, well, I think there's you just one put other your... thing you you want the cat you want to put the cat on? Yeah, I want to put the cat on. Is that is that when she comes in here realistic? she just immediately starts trying to tear down all of this stuff that I've set up to soundproof. <laughs> it's like soundproof studio slash cat playhouse. I mean you could argue that gas was trying to dismantle language to get its own <laughs> corporeal reality so bring your cat in to dismantle your audio setup and we will have achieved art through form and form through art and you know. Actually that's how you end the book, et cetera. right? He says uh, you have fallen into art. Return to life. Yeah. That's what <laughs> yeah. He's, talking, he's talking about cats. He's talking about that's, cats. What, that's it. Uh, one other topic if y'all want to uh, one other thing to talk about is the uh, He's trying to explore like the musicality of language and the simultaneity of different texts. And I guess that's what we were trying to achieve in the intro, um, which I think what, what did y'all think about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like Nathan, you, you were mentioning that like it feels like when you're reading chaos and then like something emerges from it. And that really like I've been I've been into that concept from like a word standpoint, because a lot of fiction really feels like you hang on through that throughout these like difficult sections and you really just don't know what's going on and you sort of open yourself up to just rolling with it and then eventually a concept emerges and I've always like really liked that but we've also kind of talked about I think we're talking about this with some Beckett stuff where in a weird way like some of the repetition and some of that just like bludgeoning is like being at like a harsh noise show or something 
where all of a sudden it's like so atonal and it's just like so grating. But then this thing emerges and when it emerges, it feels so pure and catchy, even though in the grand scheme of things, it's not really catchy. It's not a pop song. It's just less atonal than all of that noise you just put up with. And so like I, I get those same exact vibes from Gas, which is kind of why he's uh, one of my favorite authors is like he knows how to like set up that swell. And then when it subsides, much like the intro, where the, then there's a singular like sort of discernible voice. Then like it's like such a, a relief and it feels so beautiful. I think he he's definitely capable of that. Thanks for listening. As always, you can find us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle booksosubstance.